The Newburgh Conspiracy was the first of the three fears concerning the military that emerged uh, during uh, um, 1783, uh, and probably, probably the, most, uh, the most serious of the three. Now, military intervention in domestic politics may usefully be seen as a spectrum. At one extreme, there is the coup d'etat, in which the military takes direct control over the government. Uh, and at the other end, there is the sort of lobbying that military men do on behalf of their service interests so that um, whenever there are congressional hearings, the Armed Services Committee and so forth, um, generals and admirals and others connected with the military will go and they will sort of press their own po policy for preferences uh, in that venue or they will talk with Congress people uh, privately. Uh, to do that. That's accepted as, as, as pretty much normal. And then there are um, problems that emerge sort of midway between uh, the two. And the Newburgh conspiracy can be seen usefully as not a coup d'etat, but as a form of veiled or perhaps not so veiled blackmail. Uh, the, the basics. The Continental Army officers, part of the Continental Army, desired half pay for life. That was a European tradition. And they wanted it as a reward for their wartime services. Congress agreed in 1780 to do this, but did nothing to implement the measure, and which is not surprising because they lacked the power to tax and therefore lacked the power to make good on that, uh, that promise. Now, the officers were apparently encouraged by some in Congress known as nationalists. And these nationalists were interested in giving the Confederation government the power to tax. So the idea was these officers who were disenchanted with wanting half a for, for life and not getting it, the nationalists kind of pushed them um, to, to sort of make their concerns known to kind of lean on uh, the Confederation by suggesting, just suggesting that if they didn't get their half pay for life, that there could be uh, consequences. And the nationalists thereby hoped to prevent, convince the anti-nationalists who did not want to create a tax, uh, a taxation system for the Confederation government to vote Congress uh, those taxation powers. And in early 1783, there were broadsides, there were posters that were published anonymously, although we know now who wrote them. One of them called for demonstrations, which were, was unauthorized. The other denounced Congress and threatened its supremacy over the military. So this was one, uh, one little bit short of sedition and not far removed from treason. Washington got wind of what was going on. He intervened by calling his own meeting um, and warned against impassioned actions, much less a coup d'etat. He capped his message by a spectacular piece of impromptu theater, producing a letter that suggested Congress, Congress's good intentions he prepared to read the letter by first putting on his spectacles, which people had never seen him wear before. And as he did so, he apologized by saying that he had grown gray in the service of his country and now found himself going blind as well. The officers who are present were completely overwhelmed by this, and some openly wept, and the crisis was diffused. It simply evaporated. But the fact that it had occurred, the fact that this Newburgh conspiracy had occurred in the first place, seemed an ominous indicator of the Army's anti-Republican potential. The next was the formation of the Society of the Cincinnati in May 1783. Now on the left, you see a, a, a statue of Cincinnatus, 
who was a famous Roman hero, who was a farmer, who in an emergency was called from his, uh, from his farm, was given the powers of a Roman dictator for the, for the period of the crisis, um, used his powers to, uh, to defeat the crisis, and then turned over his powers back to uh, the Roman Senate and went back to his, uh, to his plow. This was the ideal of the citizen soldier. And so when veterans of the Continental uh, Army wanted to create some kind of fraternal organization that they could carry with them into post-war life, they created this Society of the Cincinnati, which certainly sounded innocent enough, uh, enough so that George Washington agreed to become the president of the society. And if you look at the on the right, you see this uh, Society of the Cincinnati, a medallion. It's pretty cool there. Well, Henry Knox, who had actually founded the Society of the Cincinnati, he was um, Washington's chief of artillery. He would go on to be Washington's first secretary of war. He saw it as being a fraternal and charitable organization. But there were problems as far as those who were suspicious of the military were concerned. For one thing, it was hereditary. The Society of the Cincinnati continues down to this day, and indeed, it is hereditary in the sense that in order to be a member of the Society of the Cincinnati today, you have to be descended from one of the original uh, members of the society, which suggested uh, that it might create, might be the nucleus of an American nobility. There were honorary memberships involved, and this involved the potential for a lobby group. You, know, you might give uh, an honorary membership to someone who you wanted to influence uh, in some particular way. Uh, there were proposals within the society, uh, among various chapters of the society, re regarding various issues, including a general American union, which is to say a stronger national government. And this was potentially sub uh, subversive. Now, none of these issues was intrinsically bad. They just seemed ominous because of pre-existing fears. And the timing, this all happened just after the Newburgh conspiracy, did not help. Uh, nevertheless, to repeat, Washington accepted the, the society's presidency, something he would never have done if he believed that it, was, that it posed any kind of threat to civil military relations. And so that was an indicator that he considered it benign and taken on the whole, I think that it was benign, but again, in that climate, it just wasn't seen that way. Then in June of 1783, you get a third manifestation of something that, um, that underscores, that exacerbates these fears concerning the military. Congress proclaimed an end to the hostilities with Great Britain in April of 1783 but it refused to, dis to disband the army until an actual peace treaty was signed, and that was some months yet away. Well, the troops were unhappy at this point. They wanted to go home, or they, at least they wanted to get paid because you know, they weren't getting paid regularly, and, uh, and their, their payment was in considerable arrears. And so in mid-June, some Pennsylvania troops marched on the Pennsylvania Pennsylvania State House, which was then in Philadelphia, but looks like a uh, Independence Hall, and both the state legislature and uh, the, the Congress, the, Confederal, uh, the, the Confederation government were both meeting there at the same time. And just by being there, these soldiers, um, you know, surrounding the Independence Hall, talking about their complaints uh, about not being able to go home and not getting paid properly, you know, that leaned on the legislatures, legislators pretty hard, and it was an uh, obvious attempt uh, at coercion and at blackmail. Well, Congress refused to be cowed, and ultimately the soldiers took no action. Still, it was another bad sign. And the common thread in all of this was a sense of separateness between the military and civilian society, um, an alienation. Uh, by soldiers 
against the civilians that they had left behind, which, by the way, is a chronic issue uh, in American uh, life. Veterans, particularly combat veterans, really believe that they have that they have done things and experienced things and have made sacrifices on behalf of uh, of the country that civilians simply have not made, nor do civilians have any idea of. Uh, I've met some, met a number of military veterans who, when they hear that they're being thanked for their thank, when the civilian says thank you for your service, on the one hand they're like you're welcome, and on the other hand it's like you having the foggiest notion what you were actually thanking me for. So there is this perennial sort of gulf between the military and civilians, uh, and incidents like the mutiny of the Pennsylvania line exacer exacerbated uh, this kind of uh, this kind of gap. Soldiers serve civilian society, it's true, but the requirements of military service produce values and a lifestyle at variance of that of, uh, uh, of civilians. There's this tendency to regard civilians as soft, unpatriotic, corrupt, and themselves, military personnel, as being uh, virtuous. And often this sense of being appreciated, unappreciated, results in seeing civilians as ingrates. And in revolutionary America, these fears of a standing army exacerbated this usual dynamic still further because members of the Continental Army did not like to be viewed as a standing army. Washington did not consider them to be a standing army. Over and over again, he made the point that these were citizen soldiers who had taken up arms in behalf of liberty, liberty for all Americans, that they had no intention of being a professional army that was going to ever be involved with any kind of you know, tyranny. They had fought against tyranny. They represented uh, the greatest strength of this new republic in fighting tyranny and in achieving independence. And to accuse them of being an incipient threat to liberty was deeply offensive to veterans of the Continental Army. 